I had enough wine. But. I need a little bit more. But <laughs> Anyway, um, before I do the introduction, I do want to tell everybody that this is technically our last program. However, we do have an annual meeting at November 15th, and members and non-members are very much welcome to that. We'll have a very short meeting, and then we'll have a program. The program is with Kevin Doyle and Karen Renardi, um, and they do a very good presentation about the Mayflower. And uh, so it's sort of seasonal in time for Thanksgiving. Um, and then we'll probably have some wine and uh, <laughs> more. <laughs> and uh, either some chocolate. Well, I don't know. I'll ask you. Would you rather have chocolate desserts? <laughs> Or hors d'oeuvres type things like that. Does chocolate, right? Yeah. yeah, that's what I think. Okay, unanimous. All right, that's what we'll do. Okay, so thank you all for coming, and those of you that have been with us all season, thank you very much for your support of Tales of Cape Cod. I love doing this. We all love doing this, and we love seeing you every week. So keep it up. Thanks. So, um, Morgan James Peter, a a.k.a. also known as, um, and I cannot pronounce it, Walim Wally. Wally. DeFunky Professor, is a multi-award winning interdisciplinary interdis artist, writer, and educator whose works span the mediums of music, theater, film, and literature. Born in Bronx, New York, and raised in both New York City and Mashpee, he is a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, a, violin, a violist and pianist trained in jazz and classical. He performed at Carnegie Hall before the age of 14, and by 16 was one of the youngest session players in EMI Records history. A three-time winner of the Urban Music Award for Jazz, five-time winner of the Silver Arrow Award, and a top multi-category nominee for the Native American Music Awards. He received his formal training in theater from the New African Company in Boston. He went on to pursue a successful career as a playwright and director in New York City, and his plays and performance pieces have been presented throughout the United States, Canada, as well as the Caribbean and the UK. He's the author of two books, A Mixed Medicine Bag and Land of the Black Squirrels. You'll have to explain that for me. His music and books are all widely available online. He's a tenured, tenured professor of English Communication and Black Studies at UMass Dartmouth, where he's been since 2003. Now, the Grovalatos here and they are Zig Peters. Ta da. <laughs> and Chuck for me, for Matt? For Matt, yeah. So, so they are a multi Grammy nominated soul funk ensemble and musical production team created by veteran touring and studio session players and singers, starting as a series of weekly jam sessions with their danceable, as I proved, <laughs> mix of feel-good soul and funk classics and originals, the group quickly rose as a regional favorite at bars, club events, and festivals throughout New England and New York City. A pioneering force in the South Coast thump and soul sound, the Grovelados made their de debut on Americana Indie Blues Chart with the single Do You Mind at number 11, which proceeded to spend the next 41 weeks in the top 10, peaking at number three. The 2017 release of their album, and I gotta say this, you know, I gotta say it this way, Ask O Mama, uh, <laughs> as an innovative uh, street co corner concert tour, received four Grammy nominations for pop and R&B that, that year, and also earned two additional nominations in R&B and rock the following year. So, continuing as a regional ensemble, performing as well as recording and releasing music as the resident production team and session band at Polyphonic Studios, they are also a top-level musical think tank who can produce artists and bands in virtually any genre conceivable. And I bring you, ladies and gentlemen, the Grufalados.
I will dance my way back to my seat. Okay. All right. As, ladies and gentlemen, we ought to groove a lot of those. <laughs> I invoke the energy of Storyville. I invoke the energy of the menus. You 
You see, there's a story of Cape Cod that goes back to a time of segregation. And unfortunately, what desegregation did was turn the black man's side invisible. And we don't want to tell that story because it means recognizing the truth. Don't do unto others what you're later going to have to undo. Thank you. 
some of the traditions that we have to get rid of. Now, another little funny tradition. The same joke that they used to tell my grandfather, my son heard that very same room. Discussion on jazz. We think of our well, I'm sorry, you guys would probably know this sound better.
top 10 of the chart for 41 weeks. So the guy who was worried about his wife running away with a geriatric bass player <laughs> went to the writing on a hit record. <laughs> so now, the best one's always coming. Basically, basically. Now, the tradition that that sound comes out of, there's used to be a bar in Osterville called Joe's Twin Village. 
Now, if you know the history of Gillis Swing Villa and the development of Gillis Swing Villa from the days of a speakeasy to a bar, you also know that Joe Swing Villa was one of those venues that, as a young musician, you could get your start in. Now, funny little thing, I was the Wednesday night guy at Joe's Twin Villa during the summer. And then there was a band that was the Sunday night band called West Side Soul. Now, I never bothered to go hear West Side Soul because when I heard who their piano player was, I'm like, they must suck. <laughs> and found out, no, the band was really good, just the piano player sucked. But, but to tell you how things work in cycles, now, Joe's Twin Villa, now, what we also have to look at is shifts in economy. Wonderful thing, civil rights movement, wonderful thing, integration. Bad thing, integration came away to then say we don't need black and brown businesses anymore. Somehow, what we forgot about with integration was now, you can come into our clubs and our restaurants, we can go to your clubs and your restaurants, you can stay at our hotels. That's what it was supposed to be. But instead, the belief became, well, no, because the problem is with integration, we did not wipe out the concept of white supremacy and white superiority. So what integration meant was white was better. It was an unfortunate mind game. So therefore, a lot of the venues that used to bring diversity to the Cape, actual diversity to the Cape, ended up getting shut down. And this become now, what this leads to is bands like ours have to become entrepreneurs in the deepest sense because we don't get book venues. We actually have to create our own. I can tell you the bars. And you want to know the really funny things that we get rejected on? Well, if you had more white guys in your band, maybe. I've actually been told that. <laughs> I've been told that in Chatham. I've been told that in Yarmouth. I've been told that in Falmouth. And I've been told that with a straight face. So what happens is we learn how to promote our own shows. We learn how to book our own spaces. So it ends up building us up economically. This is why, as a band, we're able to evolve into becoming a recording studio. Because we had to learn how to. We become a promotion unit because we had to learn how to. All those nice little cars that you see there had to learn Photoshop. That's one of the things that the other bands on Cape Cod don't have to do. One of the several things that the bands on Cape Cod don't have to do. Now, here's the other funny thing. We ended up, when we came out with the album last year, well, we got copies of the bag, we didn't sell it tonight, $10, so you can be fine here because it's 50 million place else. Grab one now. But when we came out with Ask Your Mom in 2017, we got told by four venues, oh, your music is in quality. So what we did was, okay, we got a record to promote. So stopped and thought about it. And I said, ah, went and read every town ordinance and found out about what does it take to perform on the street. So the towns that required permits got permits. The towns that operate under free speech, we exercised free speech. And we literally did a street concert tour. And what we found out, by the way, accidentally was, you make more money with a bucket in front of you on the street than you make playing any bar on Cape Cod. <laughs> in fact, we played across the street from a bar that we used to play in in Provincetown. I won't say the name, but it's across the street from Town Hall. <laughs> so we played in a bar that we used to play in front of in Town Hall. We set up in front of there at 6 o'clock, and we did it just to piss the owner off. So we got set up at 6 o'clock, you know, what I love about, by the way, Provincetown has the coolest police department I think I've ever encountered in life. I mean, when you talk about actual public servants and respect, courtesy, etc., <coughs> unlike any place, I don't place in the United States I've ever been. I have to say that about pizza. Um, so we set up across the street. Full, full bugs running in noxious mode because we even have um, generators so we don't have to plug into anything. We have our own electricity. <laughs> so sufficiency again. Set up there at 6 o'clock. By 8 o'clock, we were packing up, watching the band that was going on there at 9 o'clock loading in. We made literally four times as much in two hours in front of the club on the street than we ever made playing in the club. 
So consequently, we very rarely, except for the wintertime, play bars on the cave. Because that was a lesson we learned. But the other thing that we learned playing out on the street, on front of the street corner, people are buying your CD. We're selling lots of CDs. Little did we know, people who were buying the CD were members of the recording academy. So the next thing we get is a letter in the mail telling us we've received four nominations for a Grammy on our album. So keep it up. <laughs> but again, it's sort of like this is how Cape Cod's unconscious bias, I'll call it, can sometimes work against it. Because when we sweep things under the rug, you end up with a pile under the rug, and sometimes people want to find out what is that pile under the rug, and that's when they're going to see the dirt. So you disrespect a band from Cape Cod, and said band from Cape Cod gets Grammy nominations and then goes around the country telling the story how and why. And the story of what kind of environment we live in. Now enough of that, let me tell you all some more. Let me play you all some more music. We're going to give you the first one from the album. This one is called Ever So Close. Thank you. 
interesting time to open a recording studio. Especially when you're a band and you're a band that all lives in the same house and now you're under lockdown during COVID. And what you're actually seeing on stage are five different genres. Because I'm coming out of jazz and soul music. And to be specific, New York jazz and soul, very much the roots. One of my piano teachers was um, Mr. Barry Harris. My grandfather, when he came to this country, originally as a classically trained pianist, his initial work was as a producer and band leader for Decca Records, subsequently for Southern Records, so he was part of a guild building tradition. So little bits and pieces of musical roots, like I said, session playing for EMI. So coming out of New York, which is more of a melange of different styles because um, I, play, I grew up playing klezmer right along with jazz too because that was the neighborhood I grew up in. My first time getting inebriated was actually at a um, bar mitzvah <laughs> for one of my best friends. So, um, like I said, it was, that was the community we grew up in. So you could imagine Cape Cod being a little bit more of a shock to your system. <laughs> when that's, and of course, I guess the warning sign coming from New York in the summer, the warning should be the radio. Because when you're leaving New York, you have the radio stations like WBLS and Z100. And so you have your pop stations, you have your R&B stations. And just when you get beyond New Haven, you begin to lose those stations. And it's really kind of funny because WBLS, which is an R&B station in New York, suddenly becomes a country station. This one you get above the lead. I don't even want to talk about a shop to your sister. <laughs> As a kid, one minute you're listening to like um, the BT Express, and the next minute you're listening to Tammy Wynette. It's like, ah. <laughs> so, so that, that was like the warning, I guess, shot of what it was. And now, the other little funny thing was everybody in my generation can tell you exactly what direction Southwest is. And you know why? Anybody want to take a while? guess why? Because if you lived on Cape Cod, you were one shot per week to listen to anything related to R&B or hip hop was Sunday afternoon coming from Brown University, WBRU. And you had to have your antenna pointed specifically in that direction <laughs> in order to get, I'm, I'm not kidding, you had to actually wave your radio antenna in that direction if that was what you wanted to hear. And you had to have a really nice stereo. So, you know, this is almost like what people talk about in the 50s with the Ed Sullivan show. Everybody would be in one person's house because that was the one person who had the TV. Well, this was the one person who had the really good stereo. So every Sunday, we were all at their house like, <laughs> that's Cape Cod music. But um, with this situation, Mr. Vermette is actually a metal player. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, see, see, nobody showing anything. Yeah. Hey, but, but this is a heavy, this, this is a rock heavy metal guy. Wow. You can take, you can take the, the ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> started playing jazz. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> ZYG808 is a hip hop guy. He hip hop EDM Afrobeat guy. Started out playing jazz. One of his teachers who's the original drummer of the Groove Mr. the late Mr. Eddie Ray Johnson was a rock player, rock funk player. Started out jazz. The roots of what we play, that's the tradition. Being able to take jazz and take it in any direction. Now, we're being jazz players help. The very first gig that the Groovelados ever played was at a, a um, well actually the first gig we actually played was for the Multicultural Festival at Cape Cod Community College. 
Then later that night, we played a bar in Falmouth called Grumpy's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we played there. Yeah. Anyway, at the time that we got the gig, we only knew six songs. And we had a three hour set. <laughs> well, when you're a jazz player, you know how to make a song last for half an hour. <laughs> and nobody even knows that it's the same song until you go back into it. <laughs> because jazz musicians, the original DJs. There you go. There you go. Because let me give them a uh, show you one. You, you start with. <laughs> Different songs all played different, so different ways. 
awkward stops. <laughs> it's our own little amusement can get the audience like. <laughs> But, um, so now, where the funny thing comes in is when you end up with the two traditions meeting. And where it becomes really funny is I remember we went to, um, there was a place in Hyannis, it's no longer there, called the Island Inn. Oh. It was a restaurant. Yeah. And they used to have jazz jam there. We were like, oh, that jazz jam, yeah. All of us, you know, all, all the group, all the group of us, the ones who are now no longer with us, and the younger ones. We all went to the jazz jams. We're all like, jazz jam, yeah, jazz jam, yeah, jazz jam. And we get to the jazz jam, and the first thing that happens is the guy who's taking the name. So, what's your name? Waleem. Waleem. And then he decides, you know, I'm going to use your real name. That's a better jazz name. <laughs> what? I guess I'm wondering what would happen if Ahmad Jamal showed up. Or Lonnie Dow. But anyway, but it, it's sort of like, wow, that, it, it, it runs that deep. That you got to change my name to put me on the list? Really? You're going to decide what a better jazz name is? Incidentally, I already won a bunch of jazz awards with K-1. <laughs> For some reason, all the jazz clubs that hired me in New York never once said to me, the Blue Note, the Village Gate, the Bitter End, the New Yorican, Joe's Club, um, the Lex Lounge before they closed it down, the Sugar Shack, none of that, the um, all clubs in Brooklyn, None of them ever, the five spot, any of the clubs in Philly, D.C., none of them ever said, wow, you have a lousy jazz name. <laughs> the only place I ever heard that was Cape Cod. <laughs> now, another little funny thing about um, understanding when the jazz traditions clash. Um, there's a musician who once played, when I was 17, I once had, I had the pleasure <coughs> of hearing him and his band at the um, Melody Tent. Some of you might have heard of him, his name is James Brown. <laughs> in 85, James Brown and most of the members, the original members of the JBs, blew through my hands. And I had a front row seat. And I was 17 years old, one thing that I knew about James Brown's band was all of his musicians were either jazz players or they came from the historically black college marching bands. Because he loved discipline. Or the other place where you would get them is from the military the military bands. So I'm there in the front row with my real book tucked under my arm, and this was, this was a life-changing concert, I have to tell you. For me, there's music before hearing James Brown live and after hearing James Brown live. And the thing that blew me away was not as much, James Brown, I have to say, it was incredible and electric. But what blew me away was the jazz concert that his band gave for an hour and a half before he even came out on the stage. That was the sort of like for me the <laughs> moment. And the other wonderful thing was after the concert, getting to talk to this gentleman, actually getting to talk to Maceo Parker, actually getting to talk to St. Clair Pickney, actually getting to talk to Haji Ahmad, another guy with Lousy Jazz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, the with, and the thing with Haji Ahmad, now here's the other thing, funny thing with Haji Ahmad, he saw I had a real book under my arm. He goes up into the bus and comes out and he said, you said you live in New York, right? Uh-huh. Okay, when you're back in New York, go here. And what he gave me was a flyer to a place called the Jazz Cultural Theater. And he said, you're going to go there on a Monday night, and there's a guy who does a workshop. His name is Barry Harris. And I've heard of Barry Harris. And he's like, hey, but I'm like, wait. Barry Harris? He's like, yeah, Barry Harris. He's, he does workshops on Monday night. And he said, and by the way, you only need to go once a month because in that one night, he's going to give you a month's worth of homework. And he lied, he gave you two months' worth of homework. <laughs> Barry Harris completely opened up jazz for me, opened up piano. The thing, and what was a wonderful thing was my grandfather was my original piano teacher had just passed away. So within months of losing a piano teacher, he gave another piano teacher. But, and this is sometimes how that tradition goes and how that expands goes. But um, 
understanding one of the things that I also knew about the James Brown band was with them all being jazz players, there's a particular tune, some of you might know it. But over and 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 James Brown's band heard this, and remember when I talked about superimposing rhythms in a different way? Well, he heard the, the well, his, his band heard. Parliament Funkadelic. Well, 
violent, funkadelic, like I said, skipped over Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. Skipped over Cape Cod all together to go out and play man time. Well, again, Parliament Funkadelic, if you don't know, stole most of the musicians from James Brown. Their entire horn section used to be James Brown's horn section. It was that kind of thing back and forth. Again, jazz players and funk players. But the question becomes, when do we stop dictating? Because we had a funk band on Cape Cod who tried to dictate to Bernie Worrell, who was George Clinton's keyboard player, how to play keyboard and what funk was. And they were Cape Cod funk band. Let, let, let's not, let that resonate for a second. Cape Cod, fine, green, grounded funk. But nonetheless, <laughs> I digress. Cape Cod open up to the traditions that we absorbed and actually absorb the tradition and not just the elements that we find pleasing. When do we allow actual growth? When do we allow the actual musical voices to stand? When do we only want to hear the songs of Little Walter when they're sung by Elvis Presley? Why do we only want to hear Motown when it's sung by the Beatles? Ask ourselves that. And it goes, it can go in both directions. Why do I only want to hear the Beatles when it's played by Earth, Wind, and Fire? I guess I think I was 30 by the time I found out that gotta get you back to the Beatles. Guilty of the same thing because I think my son just a year or two found out that I want to hold your hand is not an Al Green song. I was very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> it's when we can expand what we listen to and when we want to because, ah, here's another little bit of music history. There was a club in New York City called CBGB's. Anybody familiar with CBGB's? CBGB's is the birthplace of punk rock. Well, I can happily say that I'm probably, well, I can't say I'm one of the few. I'm one of the main people whose name is defeated in the bathroom of CBGBs. I'm a punk rock kid as well. It was all part of the culture of New York City. It was all, and the thing is, we can't, and when you come to a place where it divides, let's hit a word. Again, now you have a song, you may wonder where I've been, searching to find the love within. I came back to let you know, got a thing for you, got to let that go. My friends wonder what is wrong with me, cause I'm in a day.
really thought that Bobby Caldwell and the Stooges wrote the same song. <laughs> <laughs> We're all singing the same song. That's, I think, the big point that they're trying to make. We're singing the same song that will allow us stupidity to divide us. And on Cape Cod, we need to stop letting that stupidity divide us. There's no reason why we can't all play the same stage. There's no reason why I should feel the need to dictate to somebody else how to play their music. I should just appreciate it because it's not the music I'm playing. That's how I grow. That's how we all grow musically. The musicians that you see up here, when um, it was mentioned in the bio that we can produce a new genre, it's because all of us, between the three of us, we literally appreciate every single genre. How many bagpipe music fans we have? Other bagpipe music fans we have in the room? Here we go. <laughs> One of my bucket lists is to learn to play the bagpipes. I've loved the bagpipes since I was a child. Now, it could possibly be genetic because I do have ancestors from Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> Some of the people who came through the Barbados stream. But that's what needs to happen. Break the walls down. Like I said, don't do unto others what you're eventually going to have to undo. Well, this is the stuff we have to undo. When we have jazz, it needs to be jazz in all its forms. I, we shouldn't have to go like there's a festival. We unfortunately missed it. Well, not completely unfortunately. Every year that it's happened, we've been part of a festival called the Boston Jazz Fest. And the slogan of the Jazz Fest is jazz in all of its forms. And what's you know, one of the wonderful and amazing things with it. But why we ended up missing it this summer was that was his first day of college. <laughs> so, we had, so we had to go to Vermont the day of the Boston Jazz Fest. But music in all of its forms. Now, when I go back to talking about um, George Clinton and about the universal elements of music, now, everybody here has heard of a gentleman named Johann Sebastian Bach, correct? Yes. Well, Johann Sebastian Bach has a style feud which is basically a bunch of arpeggios, pretty much. But there's an interesting characteristic to Johann Sebastian Bach that I actually somewhat proved when this young man was in utero. <laughs> Tell him the story! Now, one of the funny things that they always say when, you know, you, when, you know they say when a child's in utero, you play music for them. Now, they specifically said you play Mozart and you play Bach. Now, as a musician, I knew that the stimulating elements of Johann Sebastian Bach are identical to the stimulating elements of Parliament Funkadelic. Because a fugue is funk. Debate me on that. <laughs> it's basically funk. Should we play something for that? Yeah, let's do a little something. So you have... Um wife on one or two occasions woke up to headphones on her belly <laughs> as and what what of course is playing on the headphones She became my ex-wife, but no, no. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, 
it was recognizing those elements and also recognizing the same elements that you find in Mozart are the same elements that you find, believe it or not, in Count Basie and you find in Duke Ellington. They, they're identical. The stimulating points and the stimulating elements. What are the differences? The cultural, that we, the, um, cultural nuances that we apply to. The values and the devaluation that we place on them. But the bottom line is, let's all just keep playing the same song and listen to each other's song. With George Clinton, there was an interesting um, thing. George Clinton retired from music to some extent, but what he did before he retired was he blessed musicians from around the world. Well, there's one musician by the name of Daniel, Daniel Ab Abarabian. Ab I cannot even pronounce his last name. But as you can tell from the last name, he's Armenian. How you know that is because if you're Armenian, your last name rhymes with Armenian. That's something that, and that's not, that's not stupidity, that's something that actually an Armenian person told me. If their last name sounds like Armenian, it means that they're Armenian. Oh, the Beterian? Peter Beterian, yes, my old roommate in college. Be Be Peter Beterian explained this to me. So this guy, Danny, is a keyboard player, and he's part of the Funkadelic Army, as they call it. So we, we actually opened for them one time, and I'm like, okay, let's hear what this guy's doing. So we're here in the funk playing. <laughs>
Now, do you, now if we close y'all with a dance record, that means y'all got to stand up and actually dance. <laughs> or we could close with a concert piece. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your choice. <laughs> <laughs> Let's fit the rather stiff mood of the people oh, sitting in here. <laughs> so that means y'all gotta stand up, sir. I'm oh, sorry? Oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, it, it is. That's it. It's the courthouse benches. I got you. I got you. I'll tell you what, everybody stand over you can get in the aisles and stuff. There's even room over here. Let's have a dance record. Okay? <laughs> Just this one. So the name of this one is it's just is.
god. We have to ask you another thing.